God. All things work together for good for those who are called children, called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Amen. This is the word of God. I want to start my message with a rather gloomy um, story that you probably are familiar with. Uh, I read a, an article this week, this past week, on the 5th of May, to be exact, written by a IMB missionary who is in India. And I want to share what he observes there right now. This is what he writes. Death is literally in the air. I opened the veranda door of my apartment in Delhi this week and realized the sun, the sky was gray and thick. The weather app on my phone confirmed the hazardous air. Then it hit me, the cremations, the nonstop burning of bodies in my city that has overflowed into parking parks and parking lots has the sky full of ash. I've closed our doors and stopped hanging our clothes outside to avoid the sick smell of death saturated smoke from consuming us. Delhi is burning. India is burning. I am again reminded with a heavy heart that in this land of 1.4 billion people, only 2% claim to know Jesus as Lord. This means that the scenes playing out before my very eyes are but a small picture of the reality that awaits almost all Indians forever. Helplessness, fear, agony, suffering, fires that never stop burning. What a, what a gloomy uh, observation of what's happening right now. We need to pray for our sisters and brothers on the other side of the globe who uh, are suffering under this tyranny of, of death. Well, but what happened, um, as you might have read in the news last month, um, India had this, this Hindu religious festival, uh, and it's called uh, Kumela Festival, and uh, it is said that it's, it happens every 12 years, I believe, and India was under lockdown last year. They did a pretty good job of maintaining the spread of the COVID-19 virus, and so the, the government decided that you know, people could have some freedom and enjoy this religious festival. Uh, that occurs, you know, so many years. And the people of India, they risked their lives, right? They risked their lives because the hope of salvation was greater for them. The hope of salvation from COVID-19, if they pray to their gods, if they bathe themselves in the Ganges River, that uh, they will be saved from the danger. But their risk did not pay off, right? As we know from the statistics. Over 4,000 people die one day. That's that shouldn't happen, right? That's just uh, horrific. And their risk was actually out of ignorance. You know, they were seeking help from idols. And they wanted peace and hope, but there was no peace and hope as a result of what happened. With, it was foolishness to gather without being vaccinated, to gather in this number. And uh, we, we, our hearts are burdened in prayer for our fellow brothers and sisters over on the other side of the world. What was their motivation? They're seeking salvation. They, ha they want hope of salvation from the tyranny of death, of sin, of COVID-19. But if we're honest, you and I have also the same heart, don't we? We want out from the situation. When is this going to end? We're almost at the end. We see the end of the tunnel, we'd like to, I like to say, you know. We're always hoping for salvation, hoping that things will ease out and things will go back to normal, whatever that might look like in the future. Maybe also last, we can re remember last year when, in the fall, when we saw the sky turn amber color 
ashes everywhere. We see California burning, all the, the wildfires, forest fires, and we ached with nature. We thought maybe the nature was yelling, screaming at us to help them, help it to be saved. And that is our heart. We need salvation. We need salvation here and now, not just here, but also here outwardly as well. Where is the hope of our salvation for Christians? Do we look at the sky and just cast a wish, wishful thinking? Or do we pray to nature like some of the other religions do? No, that cannot be so. We Christians have Christ within us. We have God, the Spirit of God within us. And as we've been reading in the book of Romans, the Spirit of God has freed us from the tyranny of sin and death. The Holy Spirit has liberated us inwardly to be free of guilt, to free, be free of, of fear, to be free from the sting of death even in the inward man. But that does not mean that we are exempt from the sufferings of this world on the, on the outside. What gives us hope to look forward to our ultimate salvation in the future? What gives us hope right now to sustain, to persevere the pains, the sting of, of death that we experience maybe every day? What is the hope of our salvation? That's the question I want to raise uh, from this passage of Scripture. My message is very simple this morning, and this is the answer. It is this. What can we hope? What is the hope of our salvation? We hope in the glory, that's the key word today, we hope in the glory that is reserved for the children of God. Can we say that? I know that's a long sentence, but we can say it together. We hope in the glory, we hope in the glory reserved for the children of God. Reserved for the children of God. Pastor Joseph, I have, have no idea what you said, right? And Paul explains this to us in a glorious way. We put our hope in the glory that is reserved for you and I as children of God. That is the one thing we'll take away today from Paul's letter. Last week we saw uh, in chapter 8, verse 1, I'm going to just rehash very quickly. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are free from sin here. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death which means he took away the fear. He took away the uncertainties of life in here. He gave us confidence as the sons and daughters of God. The Holy Spirit leads us, always confirms our new spiritual identities as sons and daughters of God. So we can always proclaim, we can believe that we are freed from the tyranny of sin. That was last week's message. But the situation that the Roman citizens who are reading this letter, their situation was not really free. If you think about it, they were called Christians, Christ followers in the Roman Empire. Empire meaning it's, it's reigned over by a authority figure, the emperor. In fact, the emperor is, was God. So the Roman policy was, you can worship whatever you want, all these small minority people groups, you can worship your, your uh, people God or whatever, your, your culture. We respect that. You have freedom of religion, but you have to have Caesar as the ultimate Lord. And to defy that, to go against the government, ref de uh, defy the number one principle they have, that to say, Caesar is not my Lord, Jesus Christ is my Lord, is a very dangerous statement. So we see the Christians suffering outwardly more and more. This letter was written about mid-50s AD, mid to late 50s, and we know in, in history that persecution is building up. You know, Nero, you know, was coming to the scene in the early 60s, and, uh, you know, Paul eventually is, is, his head is chopped off by Nero. And after that, persecution builds up on and on to the effect, to the extent of Christians having to go underground uh, they have to live in the catacombs, the tombs, some all their lives hiding to keep their faith in Christ. Outwardly, there was so much suffering, and Paul had to give them a reason 
that they, have, they can hang on to salvation. A hope for salvation. What is that hope that we can hang on to on this side of eternity? We're not there yet. We know we're going to get it. We, we have freedom here. But what about here? How can I sustain? How can I hang on to my faith when everything is so dark, so much suffering, so much death of COVID-19? And Paul gives this answer in verse 18, the first verse that we read today. Let's go back to that verse. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, he's putting two things on a balance now, on a scale. So he's considering on a scale, suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So he weighed the present suffering that he's going every day, you know, the pains, and he balanced it with, he weighed it against the future glory, whatever that might be, and it turns out, oh my goodness, this is so much heavier. This future glory is so much heavier that, you know, I can do this. I can go through with this. That was what Paul is saying. It's not just a uh, emotional statement out of just exclamation and out of, you know, um, joy that comes from salvation, but he actually considered it mentally, logically, and I considered it, and the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us, and let this be the hope of our salvation. So that's the logic that he's uh, leading us uh, into. This thing called glory uh, we're going to go in deeper into this concept of the future glory. But before we go there, Paul takes us to the state that we're in. Not only are we suffering right now, but he explains to us that the creation, nature is suffering along with us because of us. The next verse, verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. It's meaning that the glory of the sons of God Nature is waiting for that because they are suffering. It goes on. For the creation was subjected to futility, not, with, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It's a lengthy sentence, but in a nutshell saying, God subjected nature under man. When Adam and Eve sinned, when you and I sinned, nature was cursed. We know that from Genesis chapter 3. The ground was cursed. When we tore the ground, when we sow something, it should, you know, a lot of produce is supposed to spring up, and, you know, it should really give good produce to us. But now, thorns and thistles and weeds, and you have to toil and labor, fight against nature. Animals attack. They're afraid. They're, they attack. Plants attack humans. And this is not the natural order of things, Paul is saying. They are cursed. They are in agonizing pain. And they yearn for the day that, just like people are the cause, that people will be glorified. And when the people are glorified, God will remove the subjugation of nature, remove the curse of sin from nature as well. So nature is crying out and yearning for that salvation along with us. The amber sky we saw of India is crying out, God, please redeem your people. California sky last year is crying out. Nature is crying out with us during this COVID-19. It's suffering under the tyranny of sin, just as we are. So the answer to all the suffering in our lives is the glory that is to be revealed in the children of God. What is this glory that the Bible talks about? This glory. It's a very big word, right? It's a very abstract word. What is glory? Uh, I came across a, a, uh, a beautiful statement by C.S. Lewis trying to describe our lives as we live here and having the glimpse of God's glory in the future, the glory for the children of God. It's found in the book, The Weight of Glory, and this is how he writes. 
at present, we are on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door. We discern the freshness and purity of mourning, but they do not make us fresh and pure. We can mingle, we cannot mingle with the splendors we see on the other side, but all the leaves of New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we will get in. Wow, beautiful, isn't it? I wish I could write like that, like C.S. Lewis. But more than C.S. Lewis, the Bible gives us a little bit better picture of what God's glory, the God's house, God's home, the glory of God's home looks like in Revelation chapter 21. I, I, I got this from the Message Bible. Let me read. I saw, this is John who wrote the book of Revelation. I saw a holy Jerusalem new created, descending resplendent out of heaven. I heard a voice of thunder from the th th throne. Look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. They're his people, he's their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good, tears gone, crying gone, pain gone, all the first order of things gone. It's a blurry picture of what God's glory looked like. Why is it blurry? Because we don't know what there is very specifically, what we see there inside God's glory, the new heaven and new earth, but we see what we don't see. What's gone? Uh, death is gone, weeping is gone, suffering is gone, pain is gone, 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 gone. Imagine a world without tears. Not because you can't cry or, uh, you know, you've been, you know, uh, you're under drugs. Not like that. But pain itself is gone. Imagine a world like that. Imagine a world where there is no more suffering. Not because you're under anesthesia, but the pain itself is gone. Imagine a world where death is gone. You never die. You can never die. What a glorious and beautiful world that might be. But the ultimate reason that this world, this new world, is so beautiful, is not just because the things that are, that are hurting us are gone, but because of one person who is there, the presence. Love this expression, don't, don't you? Look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men Women and men and women. Glory of God, um, the glory of the children of God is actually where the glory of God is. We experience the glory of God in the future because God Himself is glory and His presence makes everything beautiful. What is home? What is home? Home is a place where, like Pastor, uh, I'm sorry, missionary Hyung Mi Choi said, where you can come home, come to a place and say, ah, after a long day's work, you can kick off your shoes, you can uh, unlock the, the securities in your, of your hearts and you can kind of let go and just relax. Is home, what makes a home a home? Is it because you, have, you bought this multi-million house after you know, suffering many, toiling many years? Um, probably not. It's not because that's not what makes a home. Is it because you have the latest, you know, home security system running the cameras and all these systems running? Does it make it a secure home? Probably not. That's not what home is about. Home is where your parents are. Uh, you know, uh, when I was studying in the U.S., back when I was a, a, a young person, I'm still young, but I was younger, much younger. <laughs> I was a young adult. Um, I studied in the United States by myself, uh, studying abroad from Korea, as some of you know. And uh, it had been two years, and I studied not here in the Bay Area, but in the south, you know, deep south uh, in, the, in Alabama. And so I was really, really very, very far away from home, and there were not many Asians there either. So, uh, you know, I struggled a little bit, but I, I was diligent in my studies, and I got to go back home for the summer break after two years. And so I got on the plane. If you're living here, you could just take one, one stop plane, nonstop to Korea. But uh, you have to make many stops to go to Korea from where I was. So uh, it took us like, took me like 16, 17 hours 
to finally get to my destination in Korea and uh, in Seoul. I got on the bus to, to Daejeon, the, the limousine bus, and I finally arrived at home. It was really late at night. I, when I arrived at home, my parents w greeted me, but uh, noticed that it wasn't the home that I never, it was a home that I never lived in. They had moved, and so it was a brand new home. I, it wasn't really my home, home home. But my parents greeted me, they gave me, you know, tagwa uh, and stuff. Uh, it made me feel warm, and I slept that night. And I really slept that night. You see, when I slept, when I rested, it wasn't just because I was fatigued, I was tired after multi many hours of plane flight and many hours of, of uh, bus ride. It was more than that. I slept like a baby because I was relieved. I was home. I was with mom. I was with dad. I realized for the past two years, I was always so insecure. I had to hold everything tight, be careful not to make mistakes, because I'm responsible for everything, every little thing that I did. But now I had no worries. I let go. I was able to sleep. What makes a home a home? Home is where our parents are. In that regard, our church can be our home. If, uh, if your mom and dad are still alive, let us take our, this opportunity to thank our parents. You know, Call them, write to them if you can. What a blessing it is. But if they are gone with the Lord, say a prayer to our Lord and thank God for sending them to your, in your lives and um, all the, the service and love that you receive from them. Thank God and praise God for that. Also, we could use today as an opportunity to thank our senior you know, members who are truly our spiritual mothers and fathers who pray for you and I, who are living as a, as a uh, hero of faith even today. We're not sure if we can be like them you know, in their age, but thank, we thank them for being strong in the Lord and praying for us. Just like the parents are home to us. God is our eternal home that we yearn for. We can truly find rest. The glory of the children of God comes from the glory of God himself. The application is very simple this morning. Let us hope. Let us hope in the glory reserved for the children of God. In the future, you and I will have glorified bodies as children of God. But before that time comes, God gives us two gifts as children. As he is the Father, he has given us two gifts for us to hang on to during this uh, tumultuous time on this earth. First is joy of becoming more like Jesus Christ. The second is power that comes from the prayer of Holy Spirit. I'll say that one more time. The first gift that give, he gives us right now is the joy of being able to imitate his first son, Jesus Christ. We are being changed every day to become more like Jesus Christ, his perfect and beautiful firstborn son. That's what the scripture says. Let's go back to scripture in um, verse... Um, sorry, 28... Uh, rather, 29. For those whom he knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Can we then say Jesus is our brother? <laughs> uh, theologically, no. <laughs> you can't call Jesus your brother. But uh, uh, in an um, in a, uh, analogy, Paul is using the analogy that he is, a, he is the son of God, and we are sons of, and daughters of God, so that makes him our big brother. He is our model, example. And the glory that is reserved for the children of God is this, that although we are imperfect, we fall every day, we, make, we have scars all over our bodies because of the sin, because of suffering in our lives, we can aspire to be that beautiful, perfect son, Jesus Christ. We'll be like him someday. And that gives us a joy, that change in our lives brings us joy and hope as the children of God. I was listening to a brother who was sharing his uh, quiet time this past week. He was reading from the book of Proverbs, as I hope you are as well. 
And uh, it talks about how God disciplines those whom he loves. And uh, he was sharing how he was disciplined as an adult. And uh, he went through a lot of physical, you know, sicknesses. And through that experience, he got to quit drinking as an adult. Uh, brothers, that's pretty hard. If you've been drinking all your life, to quit is, it takes something dramatic. And uh, he realized this disease was coming from God, and so he quit drinking, and he confessed that. And I was just so blessed by that. How can a person, a grown-up man, confess that? And the joy there is of confessing, of joy there is of becoming more like Jesus Christ is so much greater than being a little bit uh, uh, embarrassed. Aren't we all embarrassed because of our sins? We just don't admit it. But as we are faced with Scripture every day, the Word of God, it reflects our lives, and we're able to correct ourselves. The Holy Spirit helps us to become more shaped like Jesus Christ in our hearts, in our attitudes, in our words, in our action. Someday, you and I like, will have the graceful tongues of Jesus. You and I will have the, the meek heart, the humble heart, the 100% obedient heart of Jesus Christ. Isn't that something that we can get excited about? And that's happening every day as we go to our Lord, every Sunday as we study together the Word of God. Yes, we rejoice in the joy of becoming more like Jesus Christ. Second, God gives another, another gift to us, and it is the power of the Holy Spirit. Going back to Scripture, in verse 28, it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what, we, what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. Imagine this scenario. Holy Spirit, God the Father, Holy Spirit, and God the Son, maybe they're on three thrones as kings, the leaders, the, the God, God of this universe. Imagine the Holy Spirit praying to the Father for us. And the language is something that we can't understand. It's like groans and moans, it sounds like, because it's a holy, godly language. It's God's language. But Holy Spirit who indulges within us is praying to the Father. Would you help my son? Would you help my daughter to get through, get, get across this suffering, to stand strong as a person of God? with moans and groans. Even we don't know what to pray for, but the Holy Spirit is praying for us. And as a result, we have a power that the world does not recognize. Where does that power come from? You know, I uh, looked at the uh, uh, statistics about what parents want most for Parents' Day. You know, uh, what do you think it is? You know, and this is in Korea, not here in the United States. What do you think your parents, who might be living in Korea, want the most for Obo Parents' Day? You know, the number one thing is cash. They don't want your flowers or your cakes. Or they, they probably do they appreciate it, of course. All, everything that, anything that children, you know, we saw the clip too. Just the small thing really, you know, blesses their hearts. But the real thing that they want, your parents want, is cash. Did you know that? Uh, well, I thought... Why would parents want cash? Why wouldn't they want something that's meaningful, like a present, you know, heartfelt gift that they really need and they never thought they needed, but they need it anyway, and we give it? Why don't they want that? Why do they want cash? I thought about it a little bit. Why would, as a, as a you know, a population? Well, I can come to this conclusion. Our parents want cash because they want the possibility of using it to whatever they like. They want the power, the power to decide what they want. They don't want you to decide for them. They want the, the power to get what they really want at their own time, in their own pace. You know, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing for us. We don't know what we need. We don't know what we want, really. But the Holy Spirit is praying on behalf of us for power. Holy Spirit empowers us. You know, uh, as pastor, I receive gifts from, you know, graciously receive gifts from you guys and just showing your love and appreciation, and I believe it's given to the Lord, so thank you for that.
But you know what I really appreciate when somebody says, this is what I appreciate. I, say, I, really, I really appreciate when somebody says, you know, Pastor, I am praying for you. You know, hang on. You're doing a good job. I'm praying for you. Prayer is such a bigger gift than any physical gift, any money that uh, I can receive. Because it is receiving from God himself the things that I need when you pray for a person. How much more? If Holy Spirit, if, if a person can pray for another person and Holy Spirit works, how much more if the Holy Spirit himself prays for us? That is only reserved for those who are children of God. That is the glory of the children of God. So brothers and sisters, let us hope in this glory that we have as children of God. Let us hope in the glory that is reserved in the glory in the glory of the children of God as we enjoy the joy that uh, we have as we are being conformed to the image of son, uh, our, uh, God's Son, Jesus Christ, as we experience the power every day that is not from myself, that God uses, God brings 